My name is Mike D. Lecluse, president of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking some time out of your busy schedules to join us for wireless gas detection to enhance your existing safety strategies. Today's speaker is Rick Froughton of United Electric Controls. If you're looking for quick, easy, and affordable worker protection for remote applications or maintenance outages, this webinar is for you. In this 45-minute webinar, webinar, we will cover uh, how to solve difficult toxic and combustible gas monitoring applications, how wireless gas detectors can add confidence to your existing wired gas monitoring systems, and some tips for rapid deployment and, and portable deployment. Rick joined United Electric Controls in 2000. He has 18 years experience marketing industrial process control instrumentation. He currently serves as a senior product marketing manager for electronic pressure, temperature, and gas monitoring devices. The phone lines are muted. If you have any questions, please use the question tool that's built in to go to webinar, and we'll make sure that your questions get answered. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Rick. Thank you, Mike, and hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Uh, I'd like to just share with you a very short agenda, and that is um, we're gonna talk about combining wireless and gas detectors Item two is to explore customer problems uncovered by our market research. Uh, item three is to provide some solutions to those problems that we uncovered it during the research. And then finally, we're gonna take a look at the Vanguard wireless heart gas detector from United Electric Controls. So first of all, we'll talk about um, discussing the benefits of wireless instrumentation and how they relate to gas detection. Slide is advanced. Did you see that, Mike? Yeah, we're all set. Okay, great. So we're going to compare and contrast the different types of gas detectors. We'll talk first about portable detectors, which are typically battery powered, carried by plant personnel worn on their bodies and helmets in some cases. And these are little pocket sized devices that can detect several different kinds of gases contrast that with fixed detectors, which are single gas monitoring devices. These are installed in permanent installations and similar to other field devices, like pressure transmitters, for example. There are, within this group, point detectors, and these are placed where gas emissions are most likely to occur, and gas must come into contact with the device for the sensor, for the device's sensor to detect the gas. Um, there are open path detectors, and these cover a wider area and may be less effective in protecting a specific area like a point. Uh, gas concentration can vary depending on the weather here, so wind and humidity and temperature all play a role. And then finally, there are ultrasonic detectors, and these are the most expensive. They detect high pressure gas leaks by sensing the ultrasonic noise generated by the leak. These detectors do not measure gas concentration, but may determine the volume of the leak. To give you a split, there's roughly a 65% portable to 35% fixed gas detector market. And of the fixed type point detectors make up about 85% of that, followed by ultrasonic at 12% and open path at about 3%. Today's presentation will concentrate mainly on uh, fixed point gas detector solutions. Uh, only fixed point detectors are available in a wireless configuration, so we'll concentrate on those. Um, so that brings us up to the subject matter. Um, why? wireless gas detection. And uh, wireless plays a large role in gas detection by providing more freedom of where the gas detectors are located or placed. Um, methane gas, for example, is lighter than air, so it's going to rise and collect at the highest point. This is typical of the ceiling of a garage, for example, where compressed natural gas vehicles are operated and refueled. Methane will collect there, so it's necessary to mount the gas detector high in the ceiling of these facilities. 
And this, of course, would create a maintenance challenge for those trying to calibrate instruments that are located high in the rafters, for example. Hydrogen sulfide, on the other hand, is higher than, heavier than air and will tend to collect at the lowest point. Wells and vaults are known to collect H2S, so um, detecting gas from inside these areas is, is essential for maximum safety. Common to both of these areas is the lack of infrastructure, the lack of power, lack of wiring uh, for the field instrumentation to transmit their signals. Thus, the need for wireless. Here are some numbers to consider. There's approximately 40 million heart devices currently installed. There's more than 26,000 Y heart networks currently operating worldwide. Commercial and residential wireless sensors are growing at a rate of almost 28% annually. Think of your Nest uh, thermostat in your house. Uh, that would be part of that group. There are more than 50 different y -Heart suppliers with currently available products. And network reliability has dramatically increased to better than 99%. Wireless Heart and ISA 100 are the most common open industrial protocols, and both are IEC standards. UE selected Wireless Heart for the Vanguard due to the most installations and supplier support. So next we'll look at a self-organizing mesh network and what that means. So you can add at any time to an existing network a new instrument that is is wireless heart compatible and it by entering the uh, network ID and the join key it will automatically join that network and conversely if for example a, a, a unit would start to uh, have some trouble say the battery croaked on the unit the mesh network would heal itself by eliminating that device from the network and reestablishing connections with its neighbors. So to add a device to the network, you would use a field communicator, uh, the 475 by Emerson is quite popular, to provide the network ID and the join key. The gateway will then detect the device and add it to the network. And then the gateway automatically optimizes the wireless network connections for obstructions, and distance, and signal length, and so on. This simplifies the commissioning process. It creates redundant paths to the gateway and uh, adding more instruments creates a stronger wireless network. I show a uh, rail car here in the diagram and that's an example of what can happen in an existing network that's already been set up, it's operating, but something has changed. And in this case, a rail car has passed between two instruments that are trying to communicate with each other. The beauty of a mesh network is it would heal itself in this case and reroute the communications to other neighbors and reestablish that communication all automatically, all without any intervention by the operators. Here is an example of a wireless network that's all set up. This happens to be um, uh, in someone's backyard. It's a product manager that works for Pepperl and Fuchs. And as you can see, he's got several different devices operating on that network. It's a, it's a test network that he's set up. And it's in a area where there's lots of trees, lots of brush. Um, those are issues uh, with wireless signals and again he's he's just trying to establish uh, testing techniques using this network so that this topology map shows the physical location of the wireless field instruments and shows how the network is formed to connect each device to the gateway 
Maps like this provide a graphical representation of the network and can be used to adjust device locations in order to minimize obstructions. The red circle, which you can see now, shows our uh, UE Vanguard gas detector uh, relative to the other devices in the network and the signal paths. The thickness and the color of these lines going through them and the signal strength and so on and so forth. Next, let's talk about uh, mesh network ranges. Um, I'll give you four examples here where you have heavy obstruction, worst case scenario. Um, your uh, range might be limited to 100 feet. And I'm using the tanker car example here. As a, as a heavy obstruction. Uh, medium obstructions um, might limit you to about 250 feet, for example, um, with some space between the obstructions. Light obstruction would be typical of a tank farm, and you would expect to get about 500 feet range on your wireless heart instruments. And then the best case scenario is clear line of sight, and you can expect up to 800 feet uh, between instruments. Um, the, uh, the gateway also does what's called frequency hopping. And what it does is it, it's, it's a uh, method of optimizing for traffic and reducing pinch points, for example. But it also is a security feature. Um, you know, if your target is moving, you can't hit it, so to speak. So the frequency is, is uh, hops around so that somebody trying to hack into the system would have more difficulty. And what has changed in wireless? When wireless first came on the scene, um, many people tried it, uh, some with some success and others with uh, failures uh, that just didn't work out for them. So let's take a look at what has really changed here. For those that have considered wireless in the past, the technology has changed to increase reliability while reducing complexity. You have open protocols now, such as Wireless Heart, that promote more instrument types and vendor participation. Wireless Heart gas detectors, for example, can coexist to augment and complement wired gas detectors. We're not intending to replace them. Wireless heart is a cost-effective way to increase coverage in areas of the plant that are difficult to reach. Additional sensors are easily added, and those could be pressure, temperature, flow, or level uh, to the existing wireless network. Wireless provides an instant monitoring solution, especially for brownfield facilities, where you might try to, again, augment your wired gas detectors. And then uh, um, battery life has significantly increased and the UE Vanguard claims a guaranteed five-year battery life. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a future slide. Gas detection hazards. What's out there? What are we trying to detect and prevent from happening? Uh, there are toxic gases. Um, these uh, units of measure are typically in parts per million or parts per billion. Examples of toxic gases are hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, chlorine, and that's as opposed to combustible gases, which are measured in percent LEL or lower explosive limit. Examples of combustible gases are methane, propane, and butane. And then finally, we have uh, asphyxiate gases which create an oxygen deficiency um, where the atmosphere is depleted of oxygen and people are likely to suffocate in an environment like that. So these are the gases that are common in hydrocarbon processing operations. So let's take a look at hydrogen sulfide, for example. Why would you want to monitor that? Well, it's fatal in high concentrations. Uh, the biggest risk in upstream oil and gas refining, it causes one third of all plant fatalities. It's soluble in liquids like oil. It expands when reaching the atmosphere. 
and it's colorless. Ironically, it smells like rotten eggs in lower concentrations, but as the concentrations increase, the smell goes away, and you can't smell it at all. So you could say colorless and odorless in high concentrations when you get up to the 100 parts per million level. Why monitor methane? Um, again, colorless, odorless, very volatile gas. Its chief constituent is natural gas. It's lighter and less dense than air. It's extremely flammable and can explode at low concentrations, as little as 5% lower explosive limit. It's considered an asphyxiate, so it displaces oxygen. Uh, high pressure natural gas leaks form a cloud and explode when they come in contact with an ignition source. There are many examples on YouTube. Um, I was planning to play a short video, but because uh, Murphy, Murphy's Law tried to prevent me from presenting this morning, I'm going to skip that. But um, you could go on to YouTube and just um, search for natural gas explosion, for example. There's one in China that I was going to show to you. So if you type in natural gas explosions China, you'll see the video. And it's very interesting to watch what happens. Uh, so it's all captured there. Next, we're going to look at pervasive problems. This is uh, part of our market research for the Vanguard. And I'd like to share with you some of the methods that we use to uncover pervasive problems with our customers. So what we uncovered were customer problems. And examples of that are uh, how it is costly and labor intensive to install wired gas detectors. Uh, the current infrastructure can't support additional devices. Uh, installing wired fixed detectors can take months and involve retrenching. Uh, proprietary wireless is too costly to install and maintain, and the unavail unavailability of line power in remote areas. There are some additional issues here that we uncovered. Um, for example, personal detectors are considered inadequate. Uh, they provide limited safety. An, an example of that would be an analyzer shack where um, you know, you're piping in various gases for analysis. It's a closed environment. It would have a closed door, and you're wearing your personal gas detector. So you open the door, walk in, and immediately pass out before your gas detector has even a, a chance to uh, warn you of that situation. So in this case, local alarms are, are not visible in the control room. You've got insufficient coverage that leads to accidents. Um, you can't detect emission leaks from pipes, and uh, you have insufficient resources for maintenance. So again, these were all problems that we uncovered with our customers and um, uh, what they told us about. So next, we'll look at some of the solutions and a few application examples as well. Um, Monitoring previously unreachable locations uh, like storage tanks and piping, rotating equipment uh, is, is what we mean by when we say we're augmenting wired gas detection. We have the ability to improve gas detection coverage. Uh, this would be, include perimeter fences, uh, wellheads, closed spaces like that analyzer outbuilding that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, we have the ability to avoid the cost of design, pulling, and testing of additional wiring. This saves not only cost, but precious time to improve safety and uh, provide coverage where and when it's needed. Place it anywhere without any physical constraints. That's the, the beauty of wireless. So I'll touch on a few of these uh, applications here. Um, at this particular site, uh, Chevron had a need for predictive maintenance to reduce inspection rounds. 
they were trying to identify leaks. Uh, and this situation is echoed by many other major refineries. Infrastructure includes pipes and valves, tanks, seals, pumps, and compressors. The benefit here is expected to increase productivity by improving process uptime, reducing unplanned downtime while improving safety. This next application um, is uh, monitoring methane at remote drill sites. Most remote sites have little to no wired infrastructure. Adding conduit for power and signal requires design, trenching, and testing, and can negatively impact the project schedule. Uh, this end user used so selected Y-Heart because of the long distance from the controller um, limiting wire and wiring infrastructure and the availability of an existing Y-Heart network. Um, in this application, petrochemical refinery, uh, adding new gas measurement points in an existing facility is considered inconvenient. It's time consuming and costly, particularly when the signals cross a street or a bridge. Wireless heart gas detectors can be added anytime to an existing wireless heart mesh. At this facility, the end user wanted fixed point gas detectors to complement personal detectors and warn workers before entering a dangerous space. They had power and wireless heart, but were far from the control room. So they selected the Vanguard wireless gas detector, which you see a picture of on the right. Uh, in this Coke gas refinery, um, the production of Coke produces numerous hazardous byproducts such as toxic hydrogen sulfide. As we know, as we learned today, H2S is lethal even in minute concentrations. This customer needed to run 24-7. They lacked gas detecting, detection coverage. They were concerned about hydrogen sulfide and its ability to uh, cause wire corrosion. And it already had a Y-Heart network in place. So the wireless heart gas detector provided a quick, cost-effective additional layer of personnel protection against the toxic H2S. Devices can be easily deployed and added to other wireless devices in this existing network. In this application, wireless was absolutely necessary because of the H2S wire corrosion issue. For onshore applications, adding wireless detectors is costly as much as $10,000 when you add the cost of redesign, obtaining hot work permits, retrenching, and running conduits for wires, particularly in remote applications across various elevations. Applications include monitoring tank farms and fence line locations. Wireless gas detectors save thousands in conduit wire and labor. Temporary work areas, uh, we don't often think of that when we install instrumentation. Um, wireless uh, takes away the, the leash, if you will, uh, takes away the wires so that we can literally move instrumentation around. Uh, and temporary work sites are a good example of that where you have process unit startups and shutdowns and maintenance and inspection all going on. Uh, and these can be dangerous. It's been estimated that most accidents occur uh, during startups and shutdowns for maintenance. Um, work areas typically do not have gas detection coverage in their areas. Uh, gases are not present during normal operation, but during the maintenance operation they may be. Personal detectors are not sufficient as it only warns the worker when the worker is already in the area while fixed point gas detectors can warn workers before they enter a closed space such as a tank for cleaning. Wireless gas detectors allow 
the deployment around the perimeter of a work site and inside closed spaces when and where they're needed. There was a, uh, a, a news um, report going back to October of 2015 uh, concerning the Aliso Canyon gas leak. Uh, you may have heard about this, you may remember it. It was a massive gas leak um, and caused the state of California to reconsider their um, regulations for um, uh, fugitive gases. Um, and uh, after doing that and after putting some gas detection in place, they actually had uh, another leak. Uh, so it did leak again um, and the resulting evacuations uh, spawned lawsuits and calls for tighter regulations. So this certainly is an ongoing uh, story where um, gas detection and wireless gas detection is being considered. Emerging regulations will ultimately uh, drive um, the, the adoption rate of wireless devices like gas detectors. Uh, Central Valley Gas uh, is a natural gas storage site. Um, converted, they converted this field into a storage reservoir through gas reinjection. Uh, the wells here could be a source of methane gas leaks and with the looming emissions laws, uh, Central Valley want to be proactive and take steps to develop a cost-effective way of measuring these leaks. The lack of power and signal infrastructure precluded the use of wireless gas detectors in this remote location. So uh, entering the fourth part of my presentation now, and I think we're going to be OK on time, um, I wanted to give you a cursory view of the Vanguard wireless gas detector from United Electric Controls. The slide you're looking at right now shows the product in a point detection arrangement and also one where it showed uh, as a portable device mounted on a stand where you could move it uh, around in a work area where maintenance is taking place, for example. And let's take a look at uh, a, a product overview here. We'll, we'll walk around the Vanguard toxic and combustible gas detector. So first and foremost, you have wireless capability. And we are wireless hot, heart compatible 7.2 which is the IEC 62591 standard. Um, uh, it's a heavy duty design, so it's a class one, division one and two explosion proof enclosure. A little bit more about that in a second. Um, and there's an integral mounting bracket you see on the left of the product. It has a feature that UE calls FlexSense. Um, which is uh, field interchangeable sensors. For example, you could buy the Vanguard as a methane gas detector and decide down the road that you'd want to convert that unit to a hydrogen sulfide gas detector by simply removing the methane sensor and, and putting the um, hydrogen sulfide sensor on the instrument instantly recognizes that it uh, puts you into the uh, calibration mode. So you calibrate the new sensor. And it is literally as simple as that. And we call that flex sense. Interoperability is certainly a feature of wireless heart. And it simply means for you and me that you have seamless integration with existing SCADA and AMS systems. And the battery, back to the battery here. Um, we have a, a, an extremely long lifespan uh, with five years battery life, and that's guaranteed by UE. And the battery is hot swappable, which means the enclosure in the rear of the unit and the battery itself are intrinsically safe. So I can literally unscrew the cover, pull the battery out, pop in a fresh one five years from now, 
and I'm good to go. I don't have to take the instrument out and take it back to the instrument shop for servicing. I can do this all right in the field. And calibration is very easy on the instrument. Um, we can configure and calibrate and test on site with the touch of one single button. It has a uh, graphic display right on the front that tells you what's happening, gives you prompts for what to do next uh, if you're in the process of calibrating the unit, for example. And of course, we adopted the wireless heart protocol, which is the self-organizing wireless mesh network. We're fully interoperable with other wireless heart devices. And I may have glossed over that point earlier, but what that means is any product that claims to be wireless heart compatible can be used and coexist on the same network with the Vanguard. And you, you can add and, and take away um, instrumentation from that work, network at any time. Um, it uses a 2.4 gigahertz antenna. It's a very robust design. I'm pointing my arrow at that because um, a quick and uh, a surprise when we did market research, we learned that a antenna like this with this form factor was desirable because First, we're going to use it as a handle when we pick up the Vanguard. This is the customer speaking now. And secondly, we want to keep uh, the animals from munching on the little whip antenna that is typical of other wireless devices. So we like that big, uh, heavy type of uh, antenna design. And again, the battery life is five years, replaceable without a hot permit. And we can configure the burst rate on the, the Vanguard for between eight seconds and one hour. Now, at the eight second rate, we're giving you that five year battery life. So we're not saying that we're going to sample every hour and last for five years. That's every eight seconds. We'll give you a reading and we can guarantee five year battery life at that eight second configuration rate. We have a single easy access button to initiate uh, local calibration and bump testing. Bump testing is, is nothing more than waking up the instrument. Uh, it could have been asleep for up to an hour, as we just learned. So we want to wake it up, make sure it's functioning. We press that button. That's, that's a bump test. Um, it uh, does not require connection to a heart device, a handheld or a laptop or a heart modem to complete calibration or bomb testing. That's all done in the field. And there's no need for that ubiquitous uh, magnetic wand that is often used in instrumentation where you're, you're in a class one, div one environment and you just don't want to open that cover. Um, there's no need to. There's nothing behind the cover uh, on the front of the unit that is um, needed in the maintenance operation. And again, in the rear cover, You've got the five-year battery life, um, and that's hot swappable in the field because it's intrinsically safe. The quick mount bracket allows for one-handed installation. Um, as you saw in my photo, um, there was a companion pipe and wall bracket, which allows for a wide variety of installation options. Uh, these may be deployed in temporary work areas for monitoring during maintenance, for example, or construction or fence line monitoring. Um, the arrow points right at that bracket. Um, and that's it's a quick release bracket with a little pin lock on it. Um, and again, you can do this all one handed. Uh, this may be used to monitor integrity of assets, for example, um, Identify leaking pipes and tanks and valves, pumps, compressors, and the plant perimeter fencing. Uh, each flex sense sensor automatically configures itself, as I mentioned to you earlier. They're easy to change. No tools are required. One-handed, I can just pull downward on the sensor and it, it comes off uh, into my hand. 
Uh, replacement can be done without a hot work permit. Um, the FlexSense capability is available for both toxic and explosive gases. And the, uh, they're constructed of 316 stainless steel. The battery is a 7.2 volt lithium non-rechargeable battery. That's probably one of our most frequently asked questions when the subject of the battery comes up. Um, it has to be replaced after the five years are up. And it will signal when uh, the battery voltage is at a level where it should be replaced. And it's field replaceable and uh, it's guaranteed by the manufacturer for five years. And that is the end of my presentation. I am about six minutes beyond where I intended to be at this point, and I apologize for, for being late, um, but for reasons beyond my control, that happened, and I thank you for hanging in there with me. Mike? All right, Rick, thank you very much for your presentation. As we wrap up, if anybody has any questions, please just go ahead and type it into the uh, question chat tool, and I'll make sure that we get them answered. Uh, if you have any specific application questions, feel free to give us a call at 800-9-LESSMAN. If you don't know your account manager, feel free to ask for me, Mike D. LaPluce, and I'll make sure you get taken care of. You can also reach me at my email, mikeD at lessman.com. I'll make sure you get taken care of. If you want to know more about some of the other technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. Uh, Dan's blog is very active and has tons of great tips. All of our webinars are posted both to our website and to our Lessman Instrument Co. YouTube channel. Uh, if there are some topics you'd like to see us cover in future webinars, please send me an email with the subject. We've got access to lots of product and process specialists, so I can reach out and find the best source uh, to cover the topic. Uh, at this point, Rick, I'm still not getting any questions. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, oh, All right, we Mike. Uh, we do have a question. Hold on a second. Uh, let's see. Where can we get more information on the main heart hub? Uh, Rick, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I can fill you in on that. Um, I, I think he's talking about the gateway in this question, yep. he or she. Yep. And uh, Emerson... Um, has uh, provides gateways, and so do Pepperell and Fuchs, um, both popular gateways, and I would contact either one of those companies for additional information on the gateways. Phoenix Contact also has one, and I believe theirs is on our website. Uh, so we've, we've got some information on them as well. Uh, that's the only question I have. So, Rick, okay. thank you very much again. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with your customers. All right. Thank you, Rick. Bye, everybody.